Pretty much all humans will report that the foods they're most addictive to or that are most problematic or that they're going to overeat the most are a combination of carbs and fats. The same thing is true in animals as well. So we have all these what we call cafeteria diet studies where you take rats and mice and you try to get them as fat as possible, as rapidly as possible. And they have all these complicated obesogenic rat child formulas where you want the carbs and the fats both pretty high, you know, 45% carb, 45% fat, 10% protein. You keep the protein low so the animal has to overeat carbs and fats to get really fat. And uh, we've created obesogenic rat chow that's the most fattening thing to animals. And it's this equal mixture of high carb and high fat together. But we've also done these cafeteria diet studies where they basically just feed junk food to rats and mice. And if you give rats and mice unlimited quantities of, you know, they usually just give them pizza and Little Debbie's and all this crap that's carbs and fats together. And you can basically make these lab animals as fat as you want. It seems that pretty much any omnivore mammal is going to radically overeat food that's high energy density carb and fat together. Doesn't work with just carbs doesn't work with just fat you give an omnivore mammal a high energy density carbon fat together it's going to automatically eat by 30 or 40 percent of calories Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at blueblocks.com protective eyewear for today's screen and led light infused world so as you know, if you work on a computer most of the day, you might come home and have digital eye strain. Add that insult to injury by having LED lights on in the house and more screen time, screen time during the evening, and you have a recipe for not only sore, sensitive eyes and increased risk for eye-related disorders, macular degeneration, and much more, but those screens and LED lights, especially when you're exposed to them at night, can perturb your body's circadian clock system. So today we're going to talk all about metabolism, blood sugar, ketone synthesis, fat burning, satiety, and all that with Dr. Ted Naiman. And I want you to realize that imbalanced circadian clock system from blue light and LED light, especially at night, can exacerbate all the conditions that we're going to talk about today. So for about $110 American, you can get a snazzy pair of clinically tested blue light filtering glasses and other and protective eyewear from Blue Blocks. Dot com. Again, that URL is blublox.com, forward slash HIH to save. I have a few different pairs. My wife has a pair. Even my daughter, who's seven years old, wears her blue light filtering glasses from Blue Blocks at night. They have stylish frames that you can choose from. And most importantly, again, they test their lenses to ensure they're filtering out some of the yucky light that could be harming your health. So support your body's circadian clock system. Support your eye health. Click the links below, and I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Ted Naiman. Links to his book are below, and I just want to preface the conversation that he's not anti-keto at all. He's anti-excess energy, and so we're going to really dive into all the different factors that affect satiety, energy, blood sugar responses, and much more. It's a really, really, really good conversation. I hope you enjoy, so let's cut back to it. Ted Naiman, thanks for coming back on the show. It's been about, gosh, I want to say it was October of 2017 when you came on before, we talked a lot about people's personal fat threshold, right? Which I think is a cool topic that we can dive into a little bit more, but you recently launched the PE diet book, uh, protein energy diet. That's what PE stands for. Right, right. Right. Which is fascinating. Um, and I think somewhat controversial, right? In the keto space, yeah. I feel like there's been a little blowback and things like that. So, but this is something we were on this cruise together, low carb cruise in May of 2018. You gave an amazing presentation all about protein and energy balance and the thermic effect of food and all this. Maybe for folks that aren't familiar with your work, like what, what in your clinical practice or personal experience got you kind of interested in protein and prioritizing protein? Well, I kind of got into it backwards. And the way I got into this whole protein versus energy concept is from looking at my patients with energy toxicity, right? So I have so many patients with cardiometabolic disease and they have insulin resistance and the whole insulin resistance spectrum of chronic disease, all the cardiovascular disease, all the, um, if you really, if you look at any chronic degenerative disease, it seems to be associated with insulin resistance. The more insulin resistant you are, the higher your risks, the worse your symptoms get, the less insulin resistant you are, the better. And so I realized that 
all of these chronic degenerative diseases are energy overload, and that's what insulin resistance is. You've basically tried to fit more energy in your body than it can hold. You overfill your fat cells, and then uh, only once you've overfilled your fat cells and fat has no place to go, does your glucose finally go up, and high glucose is like the final end end of, uh, phase of insulin resistance. So I have all these patients who are somewhere on the insulin resistance spectrum, somewhere towards diabetes or, or beyond. And I realized that all these people have energy toxicity. They've literally ingested too much energy in their body. And that kind of got me thinking about the big picture, like what's really, really going on here. And when you zoom way, way, way out, if you really zoom out and look at just what is eating, well, plants make all dietary energy for all animals by capturing solar energy and storing it in high energy carbon carbon bonds in carbohydrates or fats. So all of your carbs and fats are really just chains of high energy carbon carbon bonds that solar energy captured as chemical energy. The plants store this energy, and then animals eat the plants, and it passes the energy up a trophic level from the plants to the animals if you're an herbivore. And then if you're a carnivore, you eat an herbivore, and you're passing that energy up one more level of the trophic ladder. So eating too much energy is something that creates all of these problems, right? And then I thought about, well, why, why are people eating too much energy? How does that actually happen? It turns out that every time you eat, you're trying to get two things. The first thing you're trying to get is nutrients that you have to have, which is protein and minerals. And these come from soil. So plants absorb nitrogen for protein and minerals from the soil. And then plants capture solar energy and store it as chemical energy as carbs and fats. So you're eating, you're eating to get nutrients from soil, nitrogen for protein and minerals, and then energy from the sun, which is carbs and fats. And what I realized is all of these people are over consuming energy because we've somehow disconnected energy from satiety, mm. right? So big picture, all of your insulin resistance, all of your energy toxicity, all of your obesity, you've disconnected energy from satiety. So you've eaten past satiety and eaten too much energy. Well, how do you do that? Really by just stripping the carbs and fats out of real food. You know what I mean? So we have all these refined carbs and fats, your sugar, your flour, your oil, where we've stripped all the carbs and fats out of a real food. And we've left behind the protein and the minerals, the nutrients, and now you have energy disconnected from satiety, and that's going to make people overeat. And of course, high energy density carbs and fats together is actually kind of addictive and drives overfeeding like crazy because it's so rewarding. And then what we see is people are radically overeating past satiety because they actually get negative satiety from these high energy density carbs and fats together. And so I kind of came into all this backwards. I'm like, wow, look at all this energy toxicity. And then, well, what is that? And how did that happen? And then what's, what are you really eating to get? And what really drives satiety? So I realized that satiety comes from protein and minerals and the non-energy portion of your food. And then in order to fix the problem, you have to rebalance satiety with energy. You know what I mean? The best way to do that is to target protein and go out of your way to eat foods with the highest protein percentage possible. And then you're going to get your protein and mineral and nutrient satiety at a lower energy intake. And that's how I kind of backed into the whole protein versus energy thing. It was really a, a way to escape uh, eating too much energy and having energy toxicity. That's brilliant. Now, the carbohydrate plus fat together is really a problem, right? right? And you're saying that's because it, it triggers like some dopaminergic type pathway in the brain that triggers hypophagia. Like what is it about? And if we think about all the, pro most of the processed food, chips, you know, cupcakes, donuts, pizza, like all those foods that people generally overconsume, high in energy, low in satiety, but then they, you said they have like an addictive element to them. What's right. Well, there have been a lot of studies where they ask people to rate which foods they felt most addictive to or that they overate the most or that were the most problematic. 
And just the whole list of like the top 100 foods are just high energy density carbs and fats together, basically refined carbs and refined fats. It's your, it's your pizza and your french fries and your chips and your donuts and your candy bars. Um, so pretty much all humans will report that the foods they're most addictive to or that are most problematic or that they're going to overeat the most are a combination of carbs and fats. The same thing is true in animals as well. So we have all these what we call cafeteria diet studies where you take rats and mice and you try to get them as fat as possible, as rapidly as possible. And they have all these complicated obesogenic rat chow formulas where you get, you want the carbs and the fats both pretty high, you know, 45% carb, 45% fat, 10% protein. You keep the protein low so the animal has to overeat carbs and fats to get really fat. And uh, we've created obesogenic rat chow that's the most fattening thing to animals. And it's this equal mixture of high carb and high fat together. But we've also done these cafeteria diet studies where they basically just feed junk food to rats and mice. And if you give rats and mice unlimited quantities of, you know, they usually just give them pizza and Little Debbie's and all this crap that's carbs and fats together. And you can basically make these lab animals as fat as you want. It seems that pretty much any omnivore mammal is going to radically overeat food that's high energy density carb and fat together. Doesn't work with just carbs doesn't work with just fat you give an omnivore mammal a high energy density carbon fat together it's going to automatically eat by 30 or 40 percent of calories now some of these animals are lucky enough that they can uh, have an adaptive thermogenesis where they just have more activity and burn it off and stay kind of thinnish but most of them just balloon up and become obese Mm. and uh, that's uh, what's going on with carbs plus fat but we've also done studies that show that the combination of carbs and fats together is highly rewarding in the brain. It releases a lot of dopamine, not unlike an addictive drug. So it's literally a drug-like response in your brain. Mm, It's crazy. I mean, if you think about in nature, if we were to rewind the clock a few hundred years ago right now, uh, we're in Seattle in January of whatever, 1400, you know, AD. What would, there's no... To, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but a high carb and high fat together, we would have to almost go south to get avocados and fruit or coconuts and what, you know. And so if you think about it, there's a, there, the, the, the potato diet where people just see white potatoes. And then some people will say some anti keto people will say, well, how do the Okinawans or how do other countries that eat a lot of rice stay lean if this whole, you know, carbohydrate insulin model of obesity was true. And what I'm thinking as you're talking is the there's an absence of fat together with that right you have a little bit of protein in the form of fish and then maybe white rice you know you don't have the corn oil the soil the all the processed oils that we put in our modern food is that kind of what we're that's correct basically in these high carb societies fat is decreased by an equivalent amount and uh, people can get away with that that does work i will be the first one to admit it that you can absolutely pull off a high carb low fat diet i think there's some trade-offs i think you can uh, have some glucose excursions that make you hungrier more often and have to eat more often and you're a little more tied to food Mm -hmm. but as long as you keep the fat low by an isocaloric amount you're going to get by now, some people might be hearing you talk about fat in this, not negative context, but it's, I think it needs to be a, in context. Now, are you anti-fat necessarily? I mean, because there's a lot of people that will, in the keto space, try to lose weight by hitting their fat macros. I'm sure you've seen this on Twitter, like, oh, I'm new to keto, so I want to hit my fat macros, and they're trying to get 80% of their energy intake derived from fat, yet they're trying to lose body fat. Um, what would you say to that person? Well, there's a couple of things you have to understand about fat. First of all, everyone who's diabetic really has too much fat inside their body. If you're a raging diabetic and your blood sugar is 400 all the time, you really only have five or 600 grams of glucose in your entire body. That's it. Like there's such little room for glucose in your cells, in your muscles, in your liver glycogen, in your bloodstream. Uh, We're talking fairly tiny quantities. The first thing that happens is fat overload. So you've maxed out all your subcutaneous fat cells. They're literally as large in diameter as they can get. That fat spills over into your visceral fat. Once you've maxed out those fat cells, now you have ectopic fat and you get all this liver fat and you get all this pancreatic fat and you really have a fat overload 
And only then does your blood sugar start going up. So by the time you have raging out of control diabetes, you don't really have a primary glucose problem. You have a primary fat overload problem. In fact, if it was as easy to measure fatty acids in the blood as it is to measure glucose, uh, we would have thought all along that type 2 diabetes was a fat overload problem, not a glucose one. So if you have too much fat in your body, it does not make a lot of sense to eat a bunch of added fat. That's not optimal. Now, I think you have to eat a certain amount of fat for satiety. And so you have to, uh, you have to look at fat as something that's on a U-shaped curve. There's a certain amount of fat that's essential. You have to eat it. We have essential fatty acids we have to eat. You need a certain amount of fat for satiety, for gallbladder function. But if you're dumping in a bunch of added fat, it's really not that helpful. Another thing is that almost all the fat you eat is uh, stored in your in your adipocytes and only comes out later when you need it if mm -hmm. you aren't eating carbohydrates, you know what I mean? If you're not displacing fat oxidation with glucose coming in from the outside. So eating extra fat that you don't need when you have too much fat in your body is really not that helpful. I don't recommend low fat diets, however, because you're trying to solve the satiety equation. And personally, I think that the solution is to get the highest satiety for the least amount of energy. And I don't think that's at zero fat. I don't think that's at zero carbohydrate for most people necessarily. Um, I think you want both fat and carbohydrates to be low-ish if you have energy toxicity and energy overload. And what I really don't like is for people to add a whole bunch of extra fat if they already have too much fat mm -hmm. inside their body. It seems like people are doing that, right? Butter on everything, bacon's good. And I'm not, I'm not an anti-fat person either, but I do like people to realize that if like they have an energy toxicity, I love how you reframe that because that helps people understand that, yeah, they, they do have excess energy. And like you said, when you ingest dietary fat, a lot of it does go into the adipocytes and then there's some recycling. Um, if someone is sitting here listening and going, gosh, I wonder if I have energy toxicity. I know you talk about it in the book, but can we talk about body fat percentages, triglycerides, liver function tests? Like what are some ways to triangulate and figure out uh, if someone does have this energy toxicity? Got it. Okay, well, I love triglycerides. So the, the two easiest ways to measure energy in your blood is glucose and triglycerides. Glucose is sugar energy in your blood. Triglycerides is fat energy in your blood. And if you're nice and thin and you've got plenty of room in your adipocytes to store energy, when you eat a meal with a bunch of carbs and a bunch of fats, your fat cells literally just suck that energy right out of your bloodstream. And so we have these studies where lean people eat a bunch of fat and the fat cells just hoover the triglycerides right out of their bloodstream and your triglycerides stay nice and low no matter how much fat you eat. Same thing with glucose. If you have plenty of room in your liver glycogen and your muscle glycogen to store glucose, you can eat a bunch of carbs and it literally just falls out of your bloodstream down a concentration gradient into your liver and your muscles and it's gone. So if you have really low fasting triglycerides and glucose, then you're probably insulin sensitive and you probably have plenty of room for energy storage, both glucose in your glycogen, liver and muscle, and fat in your adipocytes. The problem shows up when you start to have high triglycerides and high glucose. Typically, you will see high triglycerides first. And high glucose is actually the very, very, very last thing to show up with insulin resistance. We'll see increasing waist circumference, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, all of these things first. And then the last thing um, in metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance is high glucose. So I love looking at triglycerides because it's going to be elevated in 90% of people with metabolic syndrome. And then glucose might only be elevated in 10%. Mm -hmm. There's something also called the uh, triglyceride glucose index, which is where you kind of multiply your triglycerides times your glucose and take a log function and look at them. A little too complicated for most people to even bother calculating, but it's an interesting thing to think about because you're basically combining and looking at the sum total or the product of the fat energy in your blood and the glucose energy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Is there an online calculator for that? There sure is. Okay. You can look for a uh, triglyceride glucose index and calculate it. Um, oh. It's not terribly helpful. And, and basically what I'll tell everyone listening is that 
If your glucose is in the normal range, you know, fasting glucose should be 70 to 99. If your glucose is in the normal range, your fasting triglycerides should really never go above about a 115. If you're over 115, you're just frankly insulin resistant. And honestly, it should probably never go above 100. So a really good rule of thumb is that you want both fasting glucose and fasting triglycerides to be under 100. So I'm talking about a 12-hour water-only fast, no calories, no coffee. If you fast for 12 hours and both your glucose and your triglycerides are 99 or lower, below 100, you're probably doing okay. Mm -hmm. And the lower, the better, honestly. Well, you don't want zero. But uh, on triglycerides, probably the lower, the better in a linear fashion. Uh, once your triglycerides are over 100, you're probably dealing with some amount of insulin resistance. And by the time your glucose is high, you're really screwed. I mean, mm. you've seriously got a problem. God, this is so good for people to hear because I think most doctors wait for the glucose to rise or they're looking just at HDL and LDL cholesterol. In fact, I would say, because I've worked with practitioners since 2006, and, and I think that most practitioners are not even really, maybe it's changing now, not really even keyed in on triglycerides. Like they're more, have you noticed that amongst yes. your peers? Oh, absolutely. Like I will see lab reports back to a patient from my peers and their triglycerides might be really high and nobody even comments on it. I mean, in the textbooks, we are only supposed to get excited if your triglycerides are over 500 and then we're supposed to put you on Tricor or Niacin or one of these prescription type things. And, uh, so we really don't get excited about triglycerides till they're, you know, 500 or 1,000 in terms of just the medical community. And the horse is so far out of the barn by then. It's just really terrible. I want to talk about the reversibility of this, but but kind of keep digging down this this road. There's some interesting data that came out, I think, around 2008, talking about looking at non-fasting lipid levels. Uh, and they're looking at like the pers uh, it's not the personal, I was going to say personal lipid index, but I was mixing that up with the, your personal fat threshold. But it, it has to do with this postprandial lipid response to look at kind of like a, a cardiac stress test. Mm -hmm. And so I've been, I've been following this research and I've been having this bulletproof coffee for a couple of years. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to LabCorp, have my bulletproof coffee, not put any like the normal butter I don't measure. Maybe it's half a tablespoon, whatever. And my triglycerides got to 210. Normally fasting, they're like 75. And that to me was like this it seems like that's a big swing, right? But they were, they were talking about the, the post meal challenge response. And I think it's kind of like a glucose tolerance test where you're supposed to give a standardized amount of fat. And I think it was like a hundred grams. I didn't do quite that, but I was pretty surprised. And that made me kind of reconsider. And I'm not picking on bulletproof coffee. I think if you have Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, it could be a way to crank up ketones. Right. But for me, I was like, wow, that's, I don't know if I really want that much fat energy in my blood. What do you think about liquid fat in that regard? And, and do you ever have people do a kind of postprandial fat load test? I never do oral mm -hmm. fat uh, tolerance tests, but there is a oral fat tolerance test in the medical literature, and it's usually 100 grams of heavy cream, and you measure someone's triglycerides afterwards. And uh, you're right. Um, we see people who are over fat to begin with who have just extreme elevation of fat energy in the blood. And I think this is probably bad. <laughs> and uh, to be honest, you know, you hear from the very low fat vegan side of the coin that eating saturated fat is bad and saturated fat looks bad from an epidemiological point of view. And actually, if you think about it, if you're over fat and you have way too much saturated fat, you know, palmitic acid, we, we make this, we store all these calories as saturated fat in our adipocytes. If you have way too much saturated fat in your bloodstream and you eat a whole bunch more saturated fat, I mean, how really good for you is that going to be? I mean, I, I honestly think these low fat people might be onto something when they say that eating a bunch of added refined saturated fat might not be the greatest thing if you're already over fat and you have energy toxicity, I mean, I think it's probably no better than eating a bunch of added Carbs. glucose, right? I, I don't see the difference, except we all have glucometers, so we see the glucose right away. The other thing I will say about overeating fat, if you have a glucometer, and we've had glucometer technology forever, right? You eat your, you eat something carby, you immediately see this huge spike of glucose, it gradually goes back down, and you have this immediate sense that, okay, that was bad, I should probably avoid that. 
and you can eat a whole bucket of lard, eat a whole bunch of fat, and nothing really happens, and so you don't get that feedback. What people aren't seeing is that you slowly, gradually get this elevation of both insulin and glucose and triglycerides uh, behind the scenes. So it's really gradual. Like it takes 12 hours for this fat to get absorbed in the wall of the small intestine and get repackaged as chylomicrons and go through the lymphatic system and get dumped out in the thoracic duct and hit the liver and get repackaged. And by, by the time it ends up in your fat cells or maybe ectopic fat if you didn't have room for it, you get this really big delay between when your blood sugar goes up. And where we see this in type 2 diabetics is fasting morning blood sugar. So if you're a type 2 diabetic and most mornings your blood sugar is 150 and today you drink a whole gallon of heavy cream, you won't see anything on your glucometer today, but 12 hours later, tomorrow morning, your fasting blood sugar is going to be 200. It's going to be way higher than usual. And you'll be like, wow, is this the dawn phenomenon or what happened to me? Or I must have eaten a trace carb here or there. Uh, no, you radically overate fat. And basically, it just slightly expanded all your fat cells and slightly made your whole body more insulin resistant. And so your basal insulin level goes up, your insulin resistance goes up, and then your fasting glucose goes up and uh on the uh, so i have type 2 diabetic patients they're like you know i just wish i could see a lower fasting glucose it's you know 180 every morning and i i if these people do an experiment where they eat the lowest fat diet they possibly can all day long i'm talking you know chicken breast and salad the next morning their blood they'll have the lowest blood sugar they've seen for months and mm. i don't think the LCHF, low carb, high fat community really gets that. I don't think they see that. I don't think that's on their radar as much as it should be. Basically, overeating carbs is immediately bad and you get this feedback from it. Overeating fat is bad tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's a beautiful point. And there's some, I think the first paper that I read was someone in Montreal, Canada did this, these feeding studies where they radioisotope fatty acids, I think palmitate, and they had people eat, and then they did biopsies, like you're talking about in the small intestine. And that was an eye opener to me. Exactly what you said is like these fats were lingering around in the intestine for 12, 18 hours, right? So you you overdo the coconut fat bombs or whatever, and you're, you're still seeing that effect 18 hours later, you know, because you're slowly infusing this. Whereas if you eat, um, you know, a uh, pop tart that's high in glycemic index, you know, sugars and things like that, you're going to see the ramifications right away. So I think that's a really good point for people to think about conceptually is fats and carbs are digested so differently and the, the body almost has like a delayed release in the small intestine and there's a bunch of feeding studies that have looked at this which is really interesting so i haven't seen any isocaloric feeding studies and i'm curious if you have ted where individuals have say whatever 500 calories in pure fat 500 calories of pure carbohydrates and what happens in the post meal insulin release is there some mild or is it delayed as you said Oh, it's definitely delayed. So we do see a bump in insulin from oral fat tolerance tests. But I think um, the time scale is actually so long that it's usually not studied. Now, what I have seen that's very interesting is satiety scores, both short and long term, in lean people versus obese people from protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So protein is the most satiating macronutrient for both lean and obese by a mile. Uh, both in the short term and the long term. Fat is, uh, unfortunately, in overweight people, fat is less satiating than it is in lean people. And I think part of that is because it takes so long for this fat to end up anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So it, it makes me a little bit sad when I see people uh, on some sort of very high fat keto diet, if they're really hungry, they'll eat more fat. And I'm thinking, okay, that's probably going to give you the least satiety of any macro at this point in time. And, uh, and for a bunch of reasons, first of all, because you already have too much fat, so you really don't need any more. And secondly, because it takes so long to get absorbed. And like you said, traverse the wall of the small intestine and end up anywhere. So yeah, it's just not a great satiety um, strategy, in my opinion. So we're kind of a, an example that comes to mind is snacking on nuts. Like it's so easy to overconsume nuts. And by the time you're full, 
you've already eaten a bunch. You're like, oh my gosh, like I, sh- I should not have like ate this whole bag of pistachios or whatever. And I'm not picking on nuts per se. I love them, but they're very easy to overconsume. Whereas beef jerky, I don't know that I would eat three pounds of, or a big old bag. You, by the time, yeah, you know, I think protein, the satiety hits you faster. Is that kind of what you're... That's exactly what I'm saying. But you can go ahead and pick on nuts because ironically, they're one of only two foods in nature that are fairly high in both fat and carbs at the same time. So million milk and nuts are these two foods that you find in nature that have carbs and fats together in them. And it's easy to overeat them both. And so we see a lot of uh, hibernating animals eating a bunch of nuts in late autumn. And al- that allows them to pack on a bunch of fat for the winter. Like the acorns that bears and squirrels eat really help them fatten up. And I don't know about you, but I can eat just a whole pound of nuts like it's nothing. I mean, the serving size for me is always the whole freaking can. Like, it it doesn't matter how many there are. I'm eating the whole thing. And the amount of fat grams from that that you have to consume before you get any kind of satiety is just... It's not it's not a great strategy. I mean, honestly, I don't eat a lot of nuts because I really overeat those. Uh, the satiety to energy ratio is kind of low for whatever reason. Interesting. What I found with fattier cuts of meat like ribeye, though, in contrast, is maybe it is the satiety to energy ratio is much more favorable. But like it's eat, like if I could eat a 200 gram ribeye versus 200 grams, which is about a pound of nuts, I would be more satiated and full with the ribeye. Uh, so is it the type of fat or is it just that there's much more protein to fat, the ratios there, and there's the absence of carbohydrates? It's the protein to energy ratio. Mm-hmm. And uh, ribeye is about a one-to-one food. It's got one gram, of, you know, uh, a serving of ribeye is 22 grams of protein and 22 grams of fat. And it has this equal grams of protein and energy versus nuts. Almost all your nuts are at least five grams of fat to one gram of protein. So you've got this one to five protein to energy ratio with nuts and this one to one ratio, which I think is actually optimal for maintenance with ribeye. So I think, you know, steak and eggs is the ideal maintenance diet. These foods are both right at one to one equal grams of protein and fat. And that's probably why steak and eggs is like my favorite food on the planet. So, um, yeah, you get a much more favorable protein to energy ratio with the ribeye. Mm. All right, I want to dive deeper into this, but one lingering question. A lot of people in the keto space are making these desserts. My wife is guilty of making these cookie doughs and things like that. And I find myself, I can overdo these like left and right, right? So I we try to minimize them, but she'll put in non-nutritive sweeteners, stevia, erythritol, uh, monk fruits, uh, what's the other one, allulose, right? So these are theoretically not affecting glycemic levels, but the brain still does sense this cephalic phase of sweetness. And maybe there is a small cephalic insulin response, things like that. Um, How do you feel about non-nutritive sweeteners paired with fat? I think non-nutritive sweeteners are fine in a zero calorie product. Like I'm, I'm literally not afraid of artificial sweeteners. I'm not afraid of erythritol, stevia. I'm really not even that afraid of sucralose or aspartame, but, um, I like these in a zero calorie product like a diet soda, right? So if if you we have studies suggesting that diet soda is better than water if you're overweight and trying to lose weight and I don't know that might actually satisfy some sort of sweet craving that people have for no calories at all. And you know, like erythritol and stevia, these are fairly clean. They have an insulin load of 0, they have a glycemic load of 0. But I think that when you pair them with something that has calories, you're probably going to overeat it because it's just tastier. And then I think it might start to be a problem. I mean, your almond flour, keto snacks, you know, with a uh, horrifically low protein energy ratio, when you make that sweet, you're probably going to eat even more of it. And then it's just, I don't think it's optimal. Mm-hmm. It's easy to overdo it. It's easy to overdo it. Yeah. So if you're going to do that, maybe add collagen or whey protein or something like that, or practice mindful eating strategies to say, I'm only going to eat this one. Like don't, that's what I do. I'll put it on a plate. Cause if I'm standing in front of the freezer or the refrigerator, I'll have three or four or whatever, right? Just mindlessly. So I think, you know, sometimes we need to implement some of these like behavioral science strategies to, like you said, you, you don't get nuts very often. Cause you know, if you have them, you're going to overdo them. Right. Right. So anyway, 
Yeah, it's, absolutely. And I cheat all the time. You know, a couple times a week, I will. I might eat something that's just abject garbage. But I'm very intentional and very mindful. And it has to be something really good. And it has to be something special. And it has to be maybe a social occasion. And I'm just buying one. And I'm not bringing it home with me. And that sort of thing. And to be honest, I might be just as likely to cheat with something that's carbs as I would with a keto version just because to me the protein to energy ratio is so low that it's kind of a cheat either way so well and you start this in the book you start out with the 80 20 principle you know to look at diet but also maybe apply this to your life because i, f- I feel like and correct me if, if if you notice this in your practice but i feel like the clients that i've worked with mainly women want to be and this is not a dog on women at all but they want to be very precise about exactly how many grams of protein or fat and how much cardio and how much weightlifting and very precise about their feeding fasting patterns and i like this idea of this 80 20 principle like be clean 80 percent of the time but on a friday night saturday night especially if it's in a social situation or whatever if you break the rules a little bit like you're probably going to be okay you know you don't have to be you know perfect all the time there's some feeding studies or diet studies that have looked at like taking the weekends off and if you look at compared to continuous energy restriction, those pe- there's like the same fat loss outcomes, right? So there's this being a little bit flexible, I think, is okay. And, you know, what, you talk about that in the book a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think you want to be, you know, clean 80% of the time and then cheat on top of that uh, episodically. And I think that works really well. I think that's probably mimicking... Uh, the way humans got food in their environment. And so I think that's a really sustainable attitude. And I I like that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, Before we kind of tackle protein, what about fasting? You know, are you into, there's a lot of good research now coming out with circadian um, biology and time-restricted feeding and various intermittent fasting protocols um, from a longevity versus performance how do you structure fasting and bake that into this PE diet? So for me, it depends on how overweight you are or how thin you are. So the thinner you get, the less I like extended fasting uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first of all, you can only get about 30 calories per 24 hours out of each pound of body fat. You know, so let's say I'm 160, 160 pounds and 10% body fat, and I've got, you know, 16 pounds of fat on my body, I'm getting maybe 500 calories out of my fat tissue in a 24 hour day. And next on the chopping block is skeletal muscle being broken down. So yeah, the thinner you are, the less excited about extended fasting I am. Now, if you're 500 pounds, oh yeah, just don't eat for a year. That's fine. You know, just drink some minerals. Um, you've got tons of fat, you've got tons of free fatty acids, you've got tons of glycerol, the fat uh, triglyceride backbone to make glucose out of, uh, you could fast forever. But as you get thinner and thinner and thinner, the length of time you can fast goes down dramatically. And in fact, if you're, you know, if you're an 8% bodybuilder and you're trying to get down to 4%, you will start eating protein every four hours. You're eating six times a day because you just can't harvest enough fat from your fat cells to prevent losing skeletal muscle. And uh, yes, we hear that fasting raises growth hormone and it's anti-catabolic and all this stuff. But the harsh reality is if I need, if I have a basal metabolic rate of maybe 1500 calories and I'm fasting over 24 hours and I'm 10% body fat, I will lose skeletal muscle. I have to. It's physically impossible that I won't because I I need these calories. And so for myself, I do a 16-8 fast every day. I think 168 is a really good sweet spot. If I just had to recommend one fasting protocol for the whole planet, it would be 168. Now everyone's different, but I love this two meal a day 168 thing. I think that longer fasts might be perfectly fine for people who are overweight, uh, especially people with energy toxicity. I mean, it might be just dangerous for you to eat if you're really really uncontrolled diabetic with severe energy toxicity so extended fasting is probably great in that setting but the thinner you get the less excited i am about extended fasting i still like intermittent fasting Mm -hmm. um everyone talks about autophagy and a lot of people think oh well i have to do my quarterly 
three days without eating for proper autophagy. And I'm, I'm not really buying that because you can get just as much autophagy from high intensity exercise and a lot of other things. So fasting is one of these U-shaped curves for me where there's such a thing as not enough and there's such a thing as too much. And finding the bottom of the U is uh, different in everyone, but it greatly depends on how lean you are to start. And like you said, your level of fitness, right. there was one study, I think in 2015, where they looked at lean versus sedentary, I'm sorry, lean and active people versus sedentary people. And the more physically fit someone was after a 36 hour fast, the degree of autophagy was directly proportional. So overweight sedentary people, they need to start working out because if they're concerned about autophagy, they'll get more mileage from their fast if they're more physically fit. And like you said, lean people are already getting it through exercise. So yeah, I see a lot of lean people because I promote fasting, it's it's really improved my health and my life. And I see these really lean people doing like three or four day fast. And I'm thinking to my head, like, why are you, why, why are you doing that? And it's, I notice like with me, I'm at like 13%, 12.9% body fat, whatever. Um, and so I think I have like 18 pounds of fat or 20 pounds or whatever. After 36 hours, I can't sleep. Like I start to really notice that adrenaline and cortisol surge. Uh, but some people who ha are at 25, 30%, they're like, oh yeah, day five, I can sleep like a baby. I don't know what you're right. talking about. So I, that's, I think, what you're referring to there. And I, I love how you quantify these things. It's amazing. 30 calories per every pound? Correct. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. if people get a DEXA scan, they can quantify how much body fat they have and figure out if they're, they have enough fat to meet one day's worth of basal energy. And if they don't, they could be you know, stripping down muscle. Like Absolutely. You're saying. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you really want to scale the length of fast to how overweight you are. And for example, like if you just binged for two weeks, if you went on like a cruise and just ate as much as you could every day and, and significantly packed on some pounds, uh, fasting would be a breeze for you. You'd, you just fast for a week and it would be no problem. You wouldn't really even feel it. You wouldn't even be hungry after the third day. But if you were even leaner than you are now, and tried to fast for a week, you would just be dying. So I think you have to kind of listen to your body and you have to be realistic about the fact that you will be breaking down lean mass if you're too thin and you fast for too long. And I don't think that's optimal. The other thing, okay, the one of the triggers for autophagy off or on is insulin and mTOR. And insulin stimulates mTOR a lot. And if you're really, really thin your insulin gets so low so fast from fasting, right? So I've, I've had a fasting insulin of one or uh, frequently it's two. Uh, I might have someone come into my office who's really overweight and diabetic, type 2 diabetic, and their fasting insulin levels 30 or 50 or 70 or I think 90 is the highest one I've ever seen. And so just being over fat, you're a wash in insulin at all times and you have so much insulin and so much... Uh, basically you're, you're, you're never really not stimulating mTOR and having autophagy take place. But if you're really, really thin, just an overnight fast is going to get you in this extremely low insulin state where, uh, uh, you are performing autophagy and I don't think you have to fast for days to get the same effect. I, you really have to scale the fasting up and down based on how, lean or under fat or over fat you are. And it's tough to say because you don't know what your personal fat threshold is. You'd basically have to look at the diameter of your subcutaneous fat cells to really know where you're at, which of course nobody's doing, but you have to try to guess based on your fasting glucose and your fasting triglycerides where you're at. Mm. I have some good questions on this, but I just want to link in the show notes, one of the early time restricted feeding studies at university of Alabama that was published, I think in June of 2019 showed exactly what you're saying. Uh, just doing a 16, eight, it was eating between eight and two. They looked at, they did uh, some metabolomics and tissue biopsies of skeletal muscle and they found mTOR was decreased. Various autophagy initiation proteins were increased just by compressing the feeding window, like, like you're saying, but I don't think they controlled for body fat percentage, but it was, it was, again, it's just a, another, you know, credence to, to say to people, Hey, you don't need to be so extreme. If your are, if your body composition is relatively, you know, you have a, you know, your personal fat threshold is, is okay. The, the question, Ted, that I think is interesting for people to think about is as children, as they become overweight, they, there's a lot of recidivism and they, as adults, they have a harder time staying lean. We, we know that fat cells or adipocytes kind of get undergo this hypertrophy and hyperplasia. They enlarge. 
can you shrink that? Like, like you said, you'd have to do a biopsy to look at your personal fat threshold, but like are people that have formerly been overweight, they lost the weight. It, how permanent can that be? I mean, can we, can right. we change the behavior of these fat cells over time or? Yeah, you can, you, you get some remodeling, but mm. it, it's really difficult and it takes a while. So if you've undergone adipocyte hyperplasia where you sprouted a whole bunch of new baby fat cells, which you're going to drive that process if you're constantly energy toxic, right? You're going to sprout as many new fat cells as you're capable of. And when you have all these extra fat cells and you try to deflate all of them, they're not happy, right? You, you just, your leptin goes very low. And the job of these fat cells is to have fat in them. So they're really displeased with you when you try to shrink them all down to nothing. And it takes about nine years wow. to lose these extra fat cells. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a decade. So I think a lot of people are really fighting this urge to regain and go back to uh, their settling, their previous settling point. And I think that eventually you get to the point where those fat cells have um, reabsorbed basically. And uh, you're not having to constantly fight this sort of low leptin scenario, but uh, it takes a really long time. And it, uh, I, you know, I've never been significantly obese, so I, I can't really relate, but um, I know that it's a huge uphill battle for people who are way weight reduced. Just to walk around at a lower weight is really, uh, really challenging. Because there's this drive to eat. Correct. Like this, this low leptin is driving constant satiety, is it? Right, or? absolutely. I think your, your body is uh, fighting back against this big drop in fat cell size and... Uh, uh, eventually I think you get to the place where you're kind of back to quote unquote normal, but you're probably talking about the better part of a decade. It's amazing. So there's some studies looking at this and I haven't looked at this nine years though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> we'll have to link that in the show notes. You know, I, I, Jason Fung has talked a lot about the biggest loser study, the follow-up study, and, and they've looked at total energy expenditure and resting metabolic rates and, and this and that. And it's still suppressed six years after that study in these individuals. And so it seems like, like you're saying, the body is really kind of guarding against it. And, and I would love to know your perspective on this because on Instagram, I kind of poke fun and I like Lane Norton, but I'll, I'll joke around about calories in and calories out. And so it seems like if you approach this just from a, you know, if you disregard everything we said today and you've been to like Weight Watchers or a, a traditional dietitian, they said, hey, look, here's your energy expenditure, your resting metabolic rate. You just need to be in a deficit of 300 calories per day. It seems that that's, and correct me if I'm wrong, again, my thinking that that's just a, a losing battle because once you lose body fat or lose body weight, your resting metabolic rate goes down. So then to be in a deficit, you have to decrease your calories even more. So it seems like a dog chasing its tail to the point of no return. What do you think about that? Right. This adaptive thermogenesis is just brutal. So some of these people lose a bunch of weight and their metabolic rate, you know, we would calculate that their metabolic rate would go down to 1500 calories a day, but they're really burning 1100 calories a day or something. So we'll see these huge uh, up to maybe 40% of your metabolic rate uh, slow down from adaptive thermogenesis where your body just shuts everything down because it's so freaked out about the low energy status and people talk slower, their blink rate slower. They, their fidgeting just drops off a cliff. Like they'll just, barely move and it's really dramatic and like you said if you're just looking at calories it's depressing as hell because you can only eat you know two calories a day and personally i think the way out of that is an insanely high protein percentage this is just one more reason why i'm focused on the protein to energy ratio rather than calories. I would encourage someone with a huge amount of adaptive thermogenesis to crank their protein up, maybe up to 50% of calories. You're going to be able to be weight stable or even continue to lose at a much higher caloric intake. The thermic effect of food is going to be higher. Energy expenditure is going to be higher. Uh, you want to diet down in the highest calories you can get, and the way to pull that off is to make most of them protein. So I really, really, really like the protein energy ratio better than calories uh, in, in this scenario and in all scenarios, honestly. Mm. So let's dive into that, but maybe first tackle 
Protein's complex because it's hard to kind of disentangle the environment, animal welfare. There's the, oh, eating meat causes colon cancer. Uh, it's hard on your kidneys. Like, it seems like with other macronutrients, there's so there's not so much emotional baggage that comes with it that, that kind of conflates the issue, right? So if you were to address, um, I don't know, maybe someone of a, there's a lot of the high Indian population here in the Northwest and they want to be vegan, right? And, you have, and some of them might have a obesity problem, uh, whatever, because of the diet change here in the U.S., you know, what would you say to, to like that individual who's like, oh, I, I can't eat meat, I can't eat protein. Like, how do you have this conversation with people? Well, you're right. It, it's so emotional and it's so religious and the overtones are so weird. In humans, uh, we figured all this out in animals like a million years ago. So all, you know, your whole field of animal husbandry and veterinary medicine and feeding animals, you know, you can look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of an animal feed and you know the animal needs a certain percentage of carbon which is carbon fats certain percentage of nitrogen which is protein and then all your animal feeds have a carbon to nitrogen ratio and then the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the animal carcass is going to uh, kind of resemble the carbon to nitrogen ratio of what they were eating and so we long ago figured all this out in animals but for some reason we like to pretend that we're not animals we're like something special like we're like religious aliens or something yeah we're not animals so everyone's all worried about you know killing animals and eating them and for some reason, there's all of these weird religious overtones and weird non-science, uh, magical, mystical beliefs. And uh, then the epidemiology isn't really helping. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to transcend some of the religiosity that we see of the different extremes and think about it more from a science point of view, like, okay, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of your diet is important. And where is that ratio? And what foods are going to improve that or worsen it? And uh, that's really why I'm such a carnivorous fan of animal foods, because you always have a higher nitrogen to carbon ratio in animal foods. It's just basic science, just trophic level. Like the, the plant can only absorb so much nitrogen because its roots don't reach very far. The animal comes along and eats a thousand plants and just concentrates all the nitrogen. You have bioaccumulation. All the minerals get bioaccumulated. All the nitrogen gets bioaccumulated. And then you get, you know, orders of magnitude, higher levels of micronutrients and minerals and protein in an animal food than you do in a plant food. And uh, so I, I, don't, I, I hate the religious nature of okay i you know i'm not going to eat an animal for this mystical reason when it really comes down to you know basic the elements you need to get inside your body you know what i mean yeah that's interesting what about legumes and lentils i mean is there enough night do they're probably contain more nitrogen than say like bread or pot you know wheats but is it significant Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there's definitely better and worse plant foods. Uh, soybean is definitely your highest protein to energy ratio. And soybeans have a pretty good protein to energy ratio. There's, uh, they're about a one-to-one -one food. You're actually getting about a gram of protein per gram of non-protein energy. There's a couple downsides to soy. I mean, uh, you know, you've got phytoestrogens. I don't know how worried most people need to be about those, but it's definitely a real thing. Mm -hmm. You also have to look at protein um, digestibility scores and the fact that uh, it's a lot harder to extract protein from soybeans than it is from meat. So you end up having to eat twice as much in terms of mass to get the same amount of amino acids, digestible and available amino acids. You also don't get quite as good an amino acid profile. If you look at the uh, individual amino acids, meat is going to give you this really nice spectrum, a little bit of everything, and soybeans won't. So you're kind of getting a, a half of a protein. You end up having to eat three or four times more pro, uh, soybeans to get the full complement of amino acids that you get from meat. So it's really not as good. However, if you had to look at plant foods, legumes are definitely one of my favorites. Lentils are not too bad. 
Um, soybeans are your best one. Uh, I see all these as significantly inferior to really any kind of properly raised meat. Uh, but I do encourage my vegan patients to go out of their way to eat legumes. I mean, mm. cause you've got to get your protein from somewhere and those are good options. Yeah. It seems I, I've never done well digesting these compounds. I have taken soy before soy protein and cooked it and had noticed some GI complications from the, I think there's some enzymatic inhibitors in there. And so if you don't, if you're not properly fermenting these or soaking them and, and using like some of these traditional cooking methods, they can become pretty problematic for the GI tract. But getting back to protein, um, what about, you know, I love red meat and feel like people really thrive on red meat. A lot of people that are trying to lose weight are scared about the fat in red meat. So gravitate towards, you know, in the bodybuilding space, there's tilapia, there's boneless, skinless chicken breasts. There's a lot of these lean cuts of meat that people are doing. Um, for fat loss, do you like that? Like the ribeye, you said one to one. And of course you talk about this in the book, but just want to give people kind of a primer. Right, right, right. So <clears throat> if you look at a meta-analysis of uh, exactly what macronutrients do people eat the very, very least energy. Um, so, so like Raubenheimer and Simpson, the, the guys who came up with the protein leverage hypothesis did this giant meta-analysis where they looked at 130 different studies where human it's ate an ad lib amount, but somebody tracked their macronutrients and they were trying to figure out at what macro ratio do humans eat the very, very least energy. And it ends up being at about two grams of protein to one gram of energy with carbs quite low. So your very, very lowest energy intake is sort of two grams of protein to one gram of fat with very low carbs. That's pretty much ground beef. I mean, that's, 80, 20 or that's whatever. like a grass fed ground beef. That's mm -hmm. like uh, 85, 15 uh, would be about a two to one. So I think that's probably where you're going to eat the very least. I think that if you go leaner, you might have some satiety issues. And if you go fatter, you might be overdoing energy for protein. So I, I love that. It's just like uh, I tell people who are trying to lose weight to target sort of a two to one protein to energy. I think that's kind of a sweet spot. Now you can go higher, but then people are hungrier and they have to cheat more on top of that. Mm -hmm. So like your bodybuilder is going to eat the tilapia and the whey protein and the egg whites and the ultra lean but then they have to basically eat a whole bunch of garbage on top of that, some Pop-Tarts or something to fit their macros. So they're dumping in more energy, usually on the carb side. Yeah. So it, you can never really go 100% protein or 100% energy. It always has, has to be somewhere in between. I think one-to-one -one is a really get, great maintenance zone, and two-to-one is a really good aggressive fat loss kind of zone. And so with the kind of mental hurdles that come with this, um, the heme iron, the colon cancer epidemiological studies, as a physician, how worried are you about people having, you know, significant 150, 100 plus grams of protein per day for, for dietary maintenance and then long-term health? Like, is that even, does that come on your radar? Do you even... Not at all. Okay, yeah. so first of all, if you don't have some sort of genetically inherited iron overload issue, it, it appears to me in my clinical experience that you can eat all the red meat you want without having to worry about it. Uh, I also don't think there's a real association between red meat and cancer. I mean, look at Argentina where they eat twice as much red meat as we do and they have half the rate of colon cancer. So I, what I am worried about when it comes to colon cancer is insulin resistance because people who are insulin resistant have double or triple the rate of colon cancer of people who aren't. And basically insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, grows these adenomatous polyps that end up turning into colon cancer. And so your best strategy there is to be as thin as possible. And how are you going to do that? Probably two to one red meat. You're, you're basically eating your whole cow, you know what I mean? I think that's a really good strategy for being as thin as possible. That's going to lower your cancer risk more than anything. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you, what cuts, and you talk about this in the book, but what do you, you like ribeye, ground beef, is that an eggs? Is that pretty much most of your diet at this point? Basically any properly raised animal product is awesome. And in the book, I just recommend the hell out of grass-fed beef and pastured eggs and wild-caught fish and seafood. And anytime you're just eating a whole animal that was properly raised and ate what it should eat, uh, I think you're completely winning. Uh, I, I point out in the book that if you're eating 
processed meat or meat that was improperly raised, it's probably not as good. Like a bacon, for example, you're taking the very fattest part of the very fattest animal that's been fed a bunch of soy or grains, and the protein to energy ratio is fairly low. So bacon is, you know, three grams of fat to two grams of protein. I, to be honest, if I'm trying to get thinner, I don't eat a lot of regular bacon. I might eat uh, I might actually eat turkey bacon or just uh, Canadian bacon or ham or, or steak and eggs or something leaner for breakfast, you know what I mean, I, rather than bacon. Processed meat, a lot of your conventional hot dogs and sausage are higher fat grams than protein grams, and it's probably not as good for fat loss. And, uh, yeah, I just come out and say that in the book. But anytime you've got a properly raised animal and you're just basically eating the whole thing, you're definitely winning. Yeah, I agree 100. percent And what's great is like most community. I mean, even in Omaha, Nebraska, right? And and not picking on the Midwest, but there's so much access wherever you are in the country. I've found like there's farmers around where most, outside of maybe if you live in downtown Manhattan, you have to drive to North New York or whatever to the suburbs. But this stuff is accessible if you take the time to do it, right? To go connect with a farmer or you know buy half a cow. Go in like my brothers and I. We've been doing this since 2013. Just buy half a cow or a full cow. We have it all laid out on the floor. We split it up three ways and it just it's it comes down to like four bucks a pound, four ninety nine or something mm-hmm. like that. So that's great. Uh, backyard chickens are really affordable, easy to do. You don't need a lot of space, a lot of money. There's a ton of chicken farmers that want to unload their eggs. So yeah, this is great. Um, but it's funny when you talk negatively about bacon in the keto space, people right. freak they out. They freak out. It's yeah. the sacred cow of keto, right? Yeah, I, I pick on it too because I mean I love bacon, but it's to me it's like pizza it's a treat it's because it's so right. easy to overconsume. my gosh i mean have try having just one piece of bacon good luck right i mean it's yeah. really there's something to it and i've always wondered i mean i know it's not directly the visceral fat per se but it's it's in that abdominal region you wonder about these inflammatory adipocytes and and you know what the the constitution of that fat you know ingesting that and maybe there could be some signaling i don't really know but it doesn't seem to me that eating the abdominal fat of an animal garners health promoting properties. I don't know. That's just my thinking of it. So again, I, I relegate it to a treat, but right. But yeah, good luck saying that on Twitter or Instagramming <laughs> the keto space. people. Yeah. It, it's, uh, uh, well, obviously I'm going to have my keto card revoked cause I've been down on bacon, nuts and heavy cream all at the same time. And this, right. uh, so <laughs> I'm pretty much done at this You're point. You're out of here. Yeah. Right. That's funny. No, I mean, there's, I, I think the, the pendulum is swinging. And some people lost initial weight with keto and this very high fat approach and, and maybe are looking for that next level and they hit, they, they get stuck in their own words or hit a plateau. And that's why we recommend your book and so forth. Um, let's talk about the book a little bit. I love how you talk about dietary progression. You know, uh, if someone came to me and it had never worked out, I'm not going to say, okay, we're going to do squats 10 by 10, you know, uh, relative perceived exertion, nine out of 10, you're going to be almost puking. It's like, okay, let's start with the bar, warm up and, and you talk about kind of easing your way into this. And I think that's a beautiful strategy because I think people can set themselves up for failure if they try to eat exactly like the 10% 10% body fat guru that they follow. You know, it's got to be a little bit of a stepwise approach. And is that how you kind of frame it for your... That, that's exactly right. I love that. That's beautiful. Uh, you don't just jump straight to egg whites and whey protein. You, you become aware of where the protein to energy ratio of your diet is, and you slightly raise it gradually in a progressive and sustainable fashion by just making little food substitutions. And that might be literally going from bacon to turkey bacon or going from ribeye to sirloin or going from the very fattest ground beef you can get to a leaner ground beef. So you're, you're basically just like making small intentional food swaps and replacements and in a way that you can sustain it and progress it. And, uh, it really does work. I mean, it's, uh, it's like these small gradual changes. That's awesome. I think it makes it more accessible for people, right? Because I feel like people, they get intimidated with all the things they need to change. And then they feel like they got to do all this biohacking stuff. And I like how you make it really simplified and just like, you know, Hey, just do these small little things. And it can, I feel like progress just creates this, this, you know, Jim Collins and good to great talks about this flywheel. Just, Mm -hmm. you just move this flywheel. So there's more inertia and these smaller steps compound into bigger lifestyle changes over time. And, uh, which is great. Uh, another thing I love about the book is the pictures and the diagrams. I think it really, 
hits people because we we talked about this offline like uh, we love to take the time to read good books but no one has time to do that anymore and we're so right. distracted so having you know your commentary and your science with these pictures and these diagrams and these illustrations really helps and i didn't realize this but you created all of those in adobe illustrator which is amazing yeah that's true i'm i'm kind of a nerd i'm kind of a geek i like to make these uh, graphics and that's sort of my little hobby uh, and the book is really just a picture book. I mean, there's barely any words at all. Let's face it. It's Probably really... 15,000. What do you think? <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. even know, but it's a lot of pictures. Let's yeah. put it that way. Which is great. I mean, so you must have been working on this for a long time. Yeah, I've been working on this a little bit here and there for several years. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So how did you get it? Do you have an artistic background or? Uh, no, no, no. I have a mechanical engineering degree and I did a lot of computer aided design and drafting and CAD stuff. And, uh, so I just have a thing for vector graphics and, uh, it's just kind of fun for me. That's awesome. And you're sharing these now, not all of them, of course, but on Instagram in your Twitter page, which I'll link below. And I'm sure a lot of people that are listening already follow you, but yeah, they're amazing. And the engagement, I mean, gosh, like people go nuts over these pictures, which are all included in the book. Um, so it's available for a Kindle version. Are you going to do a printed copy? Uh, we're trying to find someone who will print it. The, the book's 328 pages and maybe 500 full color photos and illustrations. And, uh, nobody will print a book that size for less than like 40 or $50. It's just so expensive. It's so much paper. It's like this huge giant coffee table photo book. Right. And it's so expensive mm -hmm. that, uh, we really haven't found any way to print it for any kind of reasonable Cost. price. So we're mostly just selling it uh, at thepediet.com as a PDF download for you to read on your iPad or something. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, there's a Kindle version also. Yeah, which I got. I like that because I can use it on all devices, you know, and things like that. But pediet.com and your website, the other, your main website is? Uh, burnfatnotsugar.com. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's kind of finish up on exercise. Um, I haven't read the entire book, but I know you talk about exercise in the book. You, last time we spoke, you do kind of more just body weight, like just a burst explosive movement every day. Is that what you're still doing? Yeah, yeah. It's really body weight. And I'm just trying to do put uh, maximum tension in the push, pull and leg chains of my body. So uh, and in the book, we talk about this. Uh, there's just these three basic human movements, push, pull and squat. And you just try to generate the highest tension you can in these movements for the longest time possible on a daily basis. And uh, uh, I think we have a workout in there that's maybe seven minutes. It's really, really, really brief, very high intensity really short duration. Which is great. Now, are you doing this pretty much every day? Some sort of variation? Yeah, pretty much every day. I think I would be fine doing it every other day. So what I do is aim for daily and then I just don't feel bad if I miss days here and there. That's good. So you don't, you manage your own expectations. Right. Which is good. Yeah. You know, I've been doing some version of that, but I like the idea of breaking it into push pull and then moving your legs and kind of in the push pull format, like you can do more of like a front squat, which would be more pushing and then pulling more like a, a low bar back squat or deadlift, things like that. But yeah, you don't need a gym or just, right. you know, I, I, we have this wood stove, so I'm chopping wood a lot, moving logs and that's like a full body thing. So it's, we can incorporate this in our daily lives without having to get an expensive gym membership. But I know you do a lot in your home gym and then now you and your daughter go, you work out at a gym together. Oh. You? Well, yeah, actually we don't go to the gym much anymore. You don't? <laughs> yeah. I did for Christmas. My daughter got a pull up bar installed in her bedroom. Nice. So now she's that's awesome. We're just doing really everything at home at this point. So yeah, we don't even really go to the gym anymore. It's convenient. More time to do research, work, hang out stuff like that. Well, Ted, I really appreciate you coming on the show. One question we'd like to ask every guest is we talk a lot about morning routines and success. Um, if you could kind of characterize, you know, some of the things that you do in the morning that, and it set your day up for success. How does that, how does that look like? How do you start your day? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't have the luxury of some big exotic morning routine because, uh, I start seeing patients at seven and, uh, I've got a, Pitbull, I have to walk at like five in the morning. So basically, I just fall out of bed, walk the dog, grab some coffee, and then hit the clinic. It, there's, I don't have any kind of meditation or, uh, yeah, I've got my morning routine is just survival mode, pretty right. much. Yeah, a lot of people are doing that same thing. I mean, that's good. You you get outside and walk the dog. 
in your coffee? Did you ever put fat in your coffee? Did you ever do the MCT and? Uh, no, no. I'm if it's uh, I try to drink cold brew, which I can drink black. If it's uh, more of a bitter uh, coffee, uh, I might add a tiny splash of half and half. But that's really all I'm putting in it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, I've gone more to espresso. I used to, I mean, I'm not picking on bulletproof coffee. I used to do you know the MCT and the butter, but now I just do black espresso, and I really like that. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome, bud. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show again. It's good to connect with you. And in the show notes, I'll put links to, to your website, thepediet.com, burn fat, not sugar, your Instagram, social media, and so forth, and uh, some of the references that we talked about today. Great. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks yeah. for having me. And we didn't, we didn't intentionally plan this. I know it's not exactly color coordinated, but people watching the video might notice a little bit oh, of yeah, purple. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just uh, ask you what you're going to wear every day. So yeah, I we just color plan coordinate. it. Exactly. I was in Portland last week, so I had to get my Powell's books. Cool. Uh, have you right been on. there? No, huh? Oh, man. You should do a talk here. It's like a really good, uh, I think it's the largest, longest lasting independent bookstore. So like there was Barnes and Nobles and then, gosh, what was the other one that went out? Borders went out of business. Mm -hmm. So it's three stories. They have all kinds of sections. It's really cool. And, oh, cool. Uh, I got to check it out. Talk about your book there.